which is an invited talk by uh, Laura Schultz. Let me just briefly introduce her. She is uh, currently a professor of cognitive science at the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department at MIT and the principal investigator of MIT's Early Childhood Cognition Lab. During her PhD, she worked with Alison Gopnik at Berkeley working on computational models of cognition. And now Professor Schultz's research investigates children's and infants' common sense understanding of the physical and social world. Um, she explores a broad range of features of distinctly human cognition and how they develop in early childhood. Uh, among them, for example, how children learn and engage in causal reasoning, how they explore their environment, and how these skills ultimately inform their social cognition. And today she will give a talk to us about a novel account of distinctly human play and how it relates to curiosity and learning. She has said that she's okay with taking questions during the um, talk, so if you have a question, just write Q in the chat. Um, Unfortunately, she can't see it, but then I will pass on that there is a question. And otherwise, there will again be a Q&A after the, after the talk where you can ask your question. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, everyone. And before I um, begin to share my screen, I'm going to take a minute where I actually can see everyone. And I'm glad you turned on the videos um, to thank uh, Gergo and Laura and all the other organizers um, for this conference. It's always one of my favorite conferences and very sad that I can't be there in person, um, but it's a pleasure to be there even virtually. Um, when I go to share the screen, I am going to lose sight of all of you and, and the Zoom chat. I remember there was a way to not have that happen, but I can't remember at this moment. Um, so, but please do feel free to interrupt. I will try to um, take questions as facilitated by Laura and, um, of course, uh, at the end of the talk as well. So thank you all very much. And I will now try to share my screen. All right, um, I'm going to be talking about play, and I think it's fair to say that few claims in the entire field of human behavior are more widely accepted than the idea that play in infancy and early childhood supports learning. Parents believe it, educators believe it, and even scientists mostly believe it. But it's also true that in the entire field of human behavior, there may be no claim that is harder to substantiate. And play is not just a problem for human behavior. Experts in animal behavior have been bedeviled by play for decades as well. Uh, the eminent ethologist E.O. Wilson said, there was no behavioral concept that has proved more ill-defined, elusive, controversial, and even unfashionable than play. And another expert in animal behavior, Robert Fagan, echoed the sentiment, the most irritating feature of play is not the perceptual incoherence as such, but rather that play taunts us with inaccessibility. We feel that something is behind it all, but we do not know or have forgotten how to see it. So why is something as simple as child's play such a hard problem? After all, there are many plausible hypotheses about why we play, and they are not mutually exclusive. Uh, so we can start with a few non-cognitive reasons that might explain the prevalence of play across species. And the first is perhaps the most intuitive. We play because it is fun. Evolution selected for animals who are motivated to engage in activities that conferred survival advantages. And then animals continue to engage in those activities and find them rewarding even in non-survival related contexts. So for instance, dolphins trap sardines within walls of bubbles and then eat them. That's a clearly functional end. But since blowing bubbles is rewarding, dolphins might engage in a, in a lot and find other ways to blow bubbles. And if you have never seen videos of dolphins blowing bubbles, uh, I recommend it as a way to pass time during the COVID crisis. Similarly, it's adaptive for primates to uh, swing through the branches and escape predators and find new territory. So primates might continue to find swinging rewarding even when it fulfills no other functional roles. 
So play might effectively be a spandrel of human development, something that endures because it capitalized on reward systems that were adaptive for other ends. An alternative hypothesis is that play is actually a taxing, somewhat costly, risky activity, and it's one you can only engage in and do only engage in if you are pretty healthy and well-fed and not terribly stressed. In short, maybe it's the behavioral equivalent of a peacock's tail. If you can play, it's an honest signal that you are healthy and fit and have abundant resources. And indeed, ethologists have suggested that young animals bound in the air to signal their overall fitness and to communicate to any watch predator that they will not be easy to catch. Some other young animals might also leap in the air to signal that they are healthy and fit and will not be easy to catch, but might be quite a catch if you caught them. So uh, uh, again, this is a, a, a different account of play and these accounts are not mutually exclusive. They might both be true. And a final non-cognitive reason that animals might engage in play is because play reduces stress and aggression and increases the likelihood of forming social bonds. So animals that engage in play fighting like this might be less likely to engage in more costly disputes uh, that cause actual, uh, actual harm. And young animals that play together might grow up to be more effective teammates when they go to hunt as a pack. Um, I will say that the evidence for all of these claims is mixed, even in animal behavior, but they have all been, uh, been proposals. So those are non-cognitive accounts of play, uh, but most of us here are interested in, in cognition. So what about cognitive accounts? And uh, certainly the most venerable account uh, comes from Carl Gruss, a German philosopher and psychologist who proposed an instrumental account of play, and he coined the term play for practice. Uh, the idea was that animals play when they are young to practice skills that they will need when they are older. And he referred to this as pre-tuning. So young otters might juggle rocks. And again, this is an excellent way to pass time in the COVID crisis, if you haven't seen these videos. Um, why might they do so? Maybe because it helps them develop the dexterity they need to use rocks to open abalone shells as adults. And perhaps in the same vein, young children engage in much of the kind of play that they do because it helps train up valuable skills that they will need in adulthood. Now, if you actually have children and you are skeptical that uh, children's play with uh, dishes is going to translate into a teenager who actually helps with the dishes, um, uh, you have my sympathies. Um, and indeed, again, even in the animal literature, there's strikingly little evidence that animal play as an individual basis, individual variability in how much animals play correlates with later skills. So kittens who play more or are given more toys to play with versus uh, deprived of, uh, of uh, strings and lights and, and ball toys don't grow up to be better mousers. Um, and meerkats who play more don't uh, succeed more in territorial disputes, um, nor do, are they less likely to disperse from their nests. So it's been very hard, even in animal behavior, to show correlations between degree of play and degree of adult fitness. Nonetheless, it seems like a plausible claim that at least some forms of juvenile play and especially motor play might directly exercise abilities used in adulthood. But the reason most of us are here and thinking about play is uh, because I think the most influential ideas about the idea of the role of play in cognition is that play helps us build better cognitive models of our own behavior and of the world. This is an account of play that has been influential in psychology and in cognitive science uh, for the past several decades. Um, it's also influenced ideas in neuroscience about models of error prediction and reward and accounts in machine learning and in AI. And it's closely related, of course, to ideas about curiosity and exploration broadly. Um, uh, uh, I can just pull from uh, some work by Pierre Oudier, who's done a lot of work on the interface between robotics and, and infant play, uh, and suggest in general, learning in these curiosity-driven activities progresses to yield an improvement of prediction or control, and thus a reduction in uncertainty. In this view, progress in prediction uh, is a primary driver. Uh, and, and I think this is a compelling claim. claim. And again, it's been uh, vastly influential and there's lots of evidence to support it. 
So we know from many studies to the point that it is a, a method that babies look longer at events that surprise them, whether the events involve uh, gravid violations of gravity or expectations about number or probability or expectations about agents and goals. Um, and we can use formal models to predict babies' patterns of looking. And babies' exploratory play uh, uh, um, uh, uh, ramps onto the uh, maps onto their causal explanatory beliefs. So, in some lovely work um, by uh, uh, Stalin Feigenson and uh, Jasmine Perez uh, and Lisa Feigenson's lab, they've shown that babies will selectively explore particular violations. So, they bang objects that look like they violate solidity. They drop objects that look like they violate gravity, and they only do so when those events are unexplained. If there's a perfectly good explanation, like what looks like a solid barrier is in fact a, uh, an arch that uh, an object can pass through, they no longer engage in this exploration. So it looks very closely tied to causal explanatory roles. And of course, there's reason to think children's exploration becomes increasingly sophisticated uh, uh, over early childhood with children, again, exploring violations uh, of their uh, of their causal beliefs um, and uh, using a lot of information that they're given from the social world uh, to modulate when they should be surprised and when they should not be surprised. So I'm, I'm gonna show you just a couple of studies from my own lab in support of this, this very same argument. And I decided to bookend it with studies from you know, really right after graduate school, very early in my career. And then the most recent, perhaps last study um, I've done or will we'll do in this vein. So uh, here, here's an early study. And it was a very simple study. It just uh, you know, noted that if children assume uh, that members of a kind will share unobserved causal properties, so if one blicket lights up a toy, all blickets will light up a toy, um, then they should engage in more exploration when causal properties vary within that kind than between kinds. So if you give them different labels for these two objects, that should be less surprising. So in specimen conditions in which we can avoid trial and error learning, having a category lets you just make a generalization about unobserved properties across the category. Principles of inductive inference will also specify the conditions in which exploration should be rational. So I'll show you just two clips from, from the study we did uh, with this. In the first study, the child is introduced to some magnet blocks and told they are blickets and indeed they stick. And then she's handed a whole bunch of other blocks which look identical, but are in fact inert. They don't have magnets in them. Um, and in this case, uh, the child's told that the second pair of blocks are DACs. So the first set are blickets and the second set, even though they look identical, are DACs. Um, and the question is, what does she think about the violation and how does she explore? And in the second clip, you're gonna see the uh, child's given exactly the same introduction to the sticky blickets, but then uh, uh, is told that the next set of objects uh, are also blickets and again, experiences the violation. And I wanna watch, uh, let you see how they play. And I apologize, there's a lot of background noise in the video. This was before we had moved to online testing and we're actually uh, in an active children's museum, um, but I'll go ahead and play the clips here. Uh-oh. See these? one block and then she goes on to play but in uh, her own way. And she keeps this up for about 
that a minute without ever testing another um, object. So you can hit it with this child here. He also um, saw the same intro that those objects up there were blickets. He thinks these are blickets and I'll let you see how he plays. All right, so he plays exhaustively, tests all of them, and is very frustrated that the objects don't share uh, properties. And indeed, that's what we found. Children tried more blocks um, in the uh, within kind than between kind condition. And uh, exactly no children uh, tried only one block in the within kind condition, whereas about half the children did in the between kind condition. So, you know, this again, so just a very close tie between rational principles of inference and children's exploratory behavior. That was the early study, I will show you uh, uh, really an equally simple study that, that we just uh, uh, ran recently. Um, and it's a study this time that involves marbles in a box. And what we did is we showed children two tubes of marbles, say one tube had nine red marbles and three green marbles. And we told the children, okay, we're gonna secretly pour one of these tubes into this box here. And you get to shake the box and figure out how many marbles are in the box. So a very simple study. Let's say nine marbles actually go into the box in this case. Uh, and the child gets to shake it and guess are there nine or are there three? And as you can imagine, this is you know, trivially easy for children. Uh, the interesting thing though, is that you can compare it with a case where you show the children, here's a tube of uh, nine red marbles and here's a tube of eight green marbles. And again, let's say nine marbles actually go in the box. Well, uh, as far as the sensory motor properties of the box go, it's exactly the same box. And if children explored based only on what they could hear or what they could feel, they should explore in exactly the same way. Um, but of course, what we predicted was that children's exploration would actually depend on what they didn't hear uh, between uh, the discriminability of these two hypotheses about what might be in the box. And th this is a much harder discrimination problem. If children represent that, if they compare what they heard to what they could have heard, then they should explore much longer in this condition. And because the beauty of marbles is we can put any kind of marbles into tubes and boxes uh, across four experiments. So each child just got four contrasts. We could compare all kinds of discrimination problems from very easy ones like nine versus one marbles to very hard ones like nine versus eight or five versus four. And moreover, we can get a quantitative measure of how hard these discrimination problems are uh, using probabilistic battles similar to what's used in approximate number theory uh, to get a measure of the relative discriminability of the samples. So that's our objective measure of how hard these are to tell apart. And it's what you'll see in the x-axis in the minute. Uh, uh, uh. And then we can look at whether children's exploratory play is sensitive to this measure of discriminability. Do they play more? Uh, uh, as the discriminability of the contrasts uh, um, gets harder, even though they're only ever hearing a single set of marbles in the box and they have to imagine what the alternative might be. So again, I'll just show you what the study looks like. All right, so remember, it could either be the one green or the eight red, and when you know, you can put your answer right there. So go ahead and play. One. One, okay. All right, so remember, there could be four yellow or five blue, and when you know, you can put your answer right there. So go ahead and put it. Five. All right. Okay. So, uh, Again, very straightforward, very simple experiment, um, but quite remarkably, both by coding from video and we also had an Arduino motion sensor in the box that could track the child's motion. Um, children's exploratory play quite precisely tracked the discriminability of the contrast across 16 different, uh, different contrasts. Um, and uh, it was entirely independent of the actual contents of the box. So again, children explored based not on what they heard, but on what they didn't hear, the difficulty of the simulated discrimination. 
again, I think this is just lovely evidence for a claim that children's play really does track uncertainty and tracks it with a, an incredible level of precision in some cases. Um, it, children seem to be sensitive to opportunities for information gain. Arguably, this does help them build better predictable, predictive models of the world. So in some sense, it should be the end of the talk. For many years, this kind of was the end of my talks and the end of the story. But I was always aware of a problem. And it was a problem that emerged right away immediately in my PhD research. So I'm going to go back in ancient time and, and show you actually a, a study I did when I was a graduate student. Uh, it was part of my dissertation work. We wanted to know if kids could use interventions to disambiguate causal structures. So we gave kids a switch and a couple of gears. And uh, intervent if you pull off one of the gear, uh, one of each of these gears, you can figure out, well, is the switch making each of them go independently? Is it making the blue gear go and turning the yellow gear? Is it making the yellow gear go, turning the blue gear, uh, et cetera? Um, so by intervening on the variables, uh, if you generate the relevant evidence, you should be able to identify the correct structure. Um, and we tested this both with children playing individually and with children playing with dyads. And surprisingly, of course, if children were playing with dyads, they did more of these interventions and were uh, more likely to generate the relevant evidence. So that's what we published in the paper. But I want to show you some outtakes from that study from some pilot work with the dyads to show you the full range of what children actually did there. <laughs> Training wheels. <laughs> oh. Sometimes they generated the evidence but in a very chaotic manner. Oh. Mm. <laughs> the green oh. I can hear it inside. It's way louder and, and sillier. So this is the point where our accounts of rational play um, I feel maybe a little strained. There's no question that children are learning, but are, or something, um, certainly they're actively exploring, but are we capturing it? And there's already a hint that our models of play might be just a little bit impoverished compared with the phenomenon that we're observing. But of course it gets much worse from here, right? Um, I'm gonna show you a clip I found the other day, including it because uh, my colleague, Josh Tannenbaum has been on me for a long while about perhaps using play with stacking cups to test children's ability to develop simple programs for things like transitivity. It's actually a very good idea, um, but I wanna show you what my daughter did do with stacking cups here. You want your mama right now? Yeah? Okay, you want my mama? Your mama is... You want to sit with your mama? Yeah? Okay, okay, okay. Hey, you don't have to. Be okay, you can get right in. Be okay. You can take her spot. Watch it. Because you didn't want just in case there was any doubt uh, about what she was doing. But there's a great deal of doubt about whether I have anything interesting to say about that as a scientist who studied play for uh, 20 years now. Um, uh, you know, these are the kinds of play, these are just random snapshots from photo albums uh, that one child engaged in. Um, and I think it's perhaps more characteristic of the ways children play than most of, uh, you know, all of my papers. Um, so play might be pleasurable. It might let us show off. It might help us bond. It might teach us real life skills and it likely improves our predictive models of the world. But when a child tries to reunite a toy octopus with his mama in a stacking cup or catch a velociraptor by sticking Play-Doh under the couch, these accounts don't seem very satisfying. 
we as scientists can use play to assess children's and adults sensitivity to uncertainty and expected information gain. But that's not necessarily the best characterization of what play is for. So I have been struggling with this for years um, and trying to close this gap. And I do think there is one thing that is true of play, both exploratory play and pretend play. And I think that's very important, by the way, because children themselves do not distinguish them. They will be in the middle of a pretend play episode with the octopus and be exploring the properties of the cup. They will be trying to catch an imaginary velociraptor and pushing around the Play-Doh and manipulating it in very different ways. So what are they doing? One thing they are doing is they are making up problems and they're inventing plans to try to solve them. Can I turn the gears into puppets? Can I hear inside? Can I reunite the octopus with her mom? And I've come to wonder if the sheer arbitrariness of these problems is not in fact the point. The problems and the solutions do not matter. What matters is both the ability to invent new problems and the ability to use problems to bootstrap new plans and solutions. Why? Because I think the hard problem of cognition is not actually learning. We actually have lots of very clever machines right now that can learn. The hard problem of cognition is thinking. It's generating new ideas in the first place. So I'm gonna borrow from some slides from a program induction workshop that took place at CogSci a couple of years ago. Uh, and the point of the workshop, these are quotes from uh, uh, the workshop uh, um, uh, advertising. Coming up with the right hypotheses and theories in the first place is often much harder than ruling among them. How do people and how can machines expand their hypothesis spaces to generate wholly new ideas, plans, and solutions? How do people learn rich representations and action plans expressible as programs through observing and interacting with the world? And I think that this is right, right? These, uh, these are some of the really hard problems. So if the hard problem of cognition is thinking, what is the value of creating problems you don't have? Why should you set arbitrary goals? Because arguably problems and goals, all problems and goals support search. They themselves, the information contained in the goal or the problem imposes valuable constraints on hypothesis generation and planning. So I'm gonna make a claim that all goals and problems are rich in information. Uh, and I'm gonna start just by having you consider the kind of information contained in question words, even before you get to the content of the questions. So merely asking a question gives you some sense of what the answer has to look like. If you say who or where or when or what or which or how uh, or why, you already know that the right answer to who is some kind of social network, the where is some kind of map, the when is a timeline, the what is a category structure, uh, the which is gonna be some kind of Venn diagram, the how maybe a circuit, uh, the, the why a causal graph. So you already have a strong constraint on what could possibly count as an answer to these kinds of questions. And every single word you add to that query gives you a little more information about what the answer looks like. Why does, why did, why can't? Well, why does, it's gonna be about some rule or empirical generalization. Why did, it's probably a violation. Why can't, it's you know some desirable thing or possible little thing, uh, 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 why, why is that turn out not to be possible? And again, you can go on and on. If you refer to an agent, then it's gonna be probably about thought or action. If it's you know, a, a convention, it's a joke. Uh, in this particular case, um, it might be a rant. You already know how to answer um, queries, um, not because of rich content knowledge per se, but because the problem or goal that you set for yourself already determines a great deal about how to answer that. And in a world where the hard problem is an infinite search space, infinite arbitrary ways that you could combine and recombine the knowledge that you have, and new evidence and new information is sparse, having and setting a goal or a problem with particular information about how it has to be answered is a really valuable strategy for narrowing down search. So uh, the argument here is that we know a lot about our problems before we can solve them. 
We know this intuitively. We can have a sense of being on the right track well before we can better predict or explain data. We can think something is a great idea even when we know that it is wrong. And I have uh, suggested uh, before that we might be able to constrain the proposals that we have on two separate dimensions. The one that we are used to, the one that acts as a, as a metric of how accurate we are and that motivates learning how well they fit the data, how well they better explain the world, the truth. But there's a different metric that we could use, which is how likely a proposal would be to solve our problem if it were true, how well it fits the constraints of the problem itself. So Stephen Colbert, a comedian in the US, used this as idea of truthiness as a joke, referring to politicians' preference for explanations that just sort of seemed plausible. But arguably, this is a feature as well as potentially a bug of human cognition, that we can use just the information in a query to set up the space of possible uh, solutions. Um, Critically, this is not just true for linguistic queries, right? These are problems posed in language, but all kinds of problems contain a lot of information about what might count as a solution. They have structure in them. We can use abstract properties of events, like their relative proportions, or whether they are continuous or discrete, um, or unimodal or bimodal, or their cyclicity, or their variance, uh, or their linear uh, or, uh, versus nonlinear growth, um, to characterize them. And what's interesting is we can and do use these to represent data of all kind. They're domain independent. We can use representations like this to think about pizza sales or about uh, the spread of COVID COVID viruses. So these representations are hugely powerful. And once you know that a problem has these kinds of characteristics, you might also be able to say something about the solution. So we may intuitively know about our problems, whether they contain discrete variables, and if so, how many values they can take in their relative proportions, or continuous distributions, and if so, their variance or skew or number of modes, are monotonic, and if so, their slope or range or cyclic, and if so, their period and amplitude. Whoops, sorry, missed one. Back. Each of these attributes can constrain the search for solutions, arguably, even if other information is sparse or non-determinative. But these seem like very technical things, right? We do capitalize them in science for all kinds of ways. Um, but a lot of the work that I and many of you and many of my colleagues have done has been to suggest that many of the things that we can analyze in our culture for scientific inquiry have their origin in intuitive representations. Um, so we can ask, are children also sensitive to these features of problems? Can they constrain hypotheses um, just based on these abstract structural features? So I'll give you uh, some example from some very new work uh, that we're just trying out. Uh, this is with my student, Maddie Pelt. If I show you these two families of aliens, and I tell you that each family of aliens brought some rocket ships, and I say, well, which group of aliens brought which group of rocket ships? This is a totally imaginary problem, and obviously there is no fact of the matter. Still, you can probably make a good guess um, based on some general prior knowledge, but much more specifically based on the relative variance in the size of the aliens and the ships. So if you solve this problem uh, like this, um, you are reasoning not about some independent data that bears on the solution, but about information contained within the structure of the problem itself, the truthiness of the solution. Similarly, if I show you the growth trajectory of two sets of candy factories and the amount of candy each factory makes each year, again, you could make a good guess without any actual data just based on the information, the kind of structural features of, uh, of candidate problems, candidate solutions. So I'll show you an example of a child doing this. Because uh, these are different than the ones that I showed you. Mm -hmm. These are sort of all the same. Mm -hmm. These are sort of all the same. All right, so she's talking here about variance. Here she's talking about linear and non-linear growth, something we've all had reason to pay attention to recently. Because this one mm -hmm. is a little bit much, and mm -hmm. this one is a little tiny bit more much, and mm -hmm. this one is a little tiny bit more much, uh -huh. and this one is a little 
tiny bit more milk. Right. And this one starts out small, starts out tiny, mm -hmm. and then go, grows kind of a lot bigger, mm -hmm. and then grows kind of a lot bigger, and then grows super big. Awesome. <laughs> So I'd like to um, present this video to everyone who thinks that exponential growth is a hard concept to, uh, to explain, or at least nonlinear growth. Um, so um, again, note there's no fact of the matter. There's the answer's not necessarily right, but at least they could be right. And the structure of the problem allows children to endorse plausible hypotheses that go far beyond the data. So what does this have to do with play? Arguably, the point of play is not that the ideas children propose and play are accurate or even verifiable, or that the plans are achievable, which is to suggest play may not chiefly be about getting the world right. The point of play may be that it sets up problems and gives you new things to be right or wrong at. Uh, about. So we may be motivated to play and explore, not only by the progress we make in learning, but by the progress we make in thinking. How many new ideas does this problem allow you to generate? We may be sensitive to metrics of thought. The fact that a problem contains enough information to let us generate a thought or plan might itself be motivating, independent of whether those ideas are right or wrong or practical or feasible uh, or even testable. So in support of this, uh, although my work and many other people's has been motivated by treating play as a kind of rational exploration, I want to point out a, a fairly obvious fact, which is that the problems we set up and play differ in very critical ways from those we undertake when we are not playing. Um, so I'm going to show you some other recent work. This is by my graduate student, uh, Junyi Chu. And she did a very simple contrast. Um, where in both cases, children had a functional goal. There were stickers in this box. They wanted to get stickers. Um, and as you, you know, all of you as developmentalists, stickers for children are like paychecks for adults. Um, uh, and in one case, they were just told these are there are stickers in this box. Can you go in here and try to get one? In the other case, they were told there are stickers in this box. Can you play in here and try to get one? And I want to show you what the children did. child took an efficient, rational action, right? Um, moved directly in a straight line to the path towards the goal, just as you might expect a rational agent to do. And then she backs away from the stickers uh, actually, oh, I didn't continue the video. Um, she actually backs away from the video at this point, starts back at the beginning and proceeds to do the entire route again, walking backwards, right? So these are, are no longer efficient actions, right? This is not super consistent with an idea of the rational efficiency of play. Let me show you another example. I need a, uh, a Jenny um, uh, said to the child, I need a pencil to fill out this form. Can you go over there and try to get a pencil? In the second case, she had a pencil of her own. She said, I need to fill out this form while I'm doing that. Can you play over there and try to get a pencil? So this is what this looks like. Rational agent engaging in efficient action. And this is what this looks like. What you might not notice is that there's Velcro on the wall and some pencils stuck to it. There's also, of course, a pencil in the cup, just as before. He already has a pencil, but it said to go get some more at great cost. And then he deploys a little tool use and uses the one pencil eventually to get the other. Okay. 
And that is basically what we found. When children were told merely to achieve the instrumental goal, they took efficient actions. When children were to, to play and get exactly the same goal, um, they largely took actions that by any measure would be construed as inefficient actions uh, if you were only considering that goal. Um, so I think of this study and I think of a quote by uh, the American writer Mark Twain uh, uh, and uh, the classic Tom Sawyer where he says, play consists in whatever a body is not obliged to do. So this is a old observation in some ways, uh, the idea that people engage and animals even engage in self handicapping behavior often in play has, has been noted before, but it's an interesting um, uh, phenomenon because although children violate principles of rational action and play, it is not to say that children act either randomly or irrationally. Even when they opt for the harder task, children behave efficiently with respect to that task. They adhere closely to that twirly spiral path. They don't jump in odd directions. They jump directly towards the pencils. It's just that they didn't need to walk on the spiral or jump at all which is to say behavior in play is conditionally rational. It is rational with respect to what I'm gonna to refer to as a manipulated utility function where children uh, uh, go towards this arbitrary goal. Uh, uh, the pencil isn't actually needed in the case that they're jumping for it uh, and they willingly incur unnecessary costs. Now, I don't mean to imply that play isn't serious or that we don't take it seriously. I take it more seriously maybe than anyone, but of course there's also a billion dollar sports and entertainment industry out there that takes very play very seriously. And individual children can be deadly serious about the outcome of their little league baseball games or checkers games. But the fact that you can have real utilities, genuine financial or social emotional costs and rewards tied up with play, is independent of the fundamentally unreal arbitrary utilities that compose play itself. There's a cost of running around bases as unnecessary or only moving your pieces diagonally. And the rewards of making it to home base or the other side of the board don't depend on your personal degree of investment in the game. They apply whether you play purely for fun or in earnest. Manipulated utilities are intrinsic properties of play itself. In play, neither the costs nor the rewards are real. If they are, you are no longer playing. In this sense, all play is pretend play. In play, we hack our own utility functions to create novel goals. It is not obvious to me that this in general supports generalizable learning about walking in spirals, about jumping for children of this age, maybe. But it does seem clear that this allows us as a species to take on innumerable goals. And this might be the most characteristic peculiarity of the human species. We have many, but here's, here's one of them for certain, which is that we populate the world with problems of our own making. We want to, across individuals, do things ranging from ending poverty to curing cancer, to writing the great American novel, to achieving enlightenment, to winning dog show contests, to eating more hot dogs than anyone else, to creating the most beautiful desserts ever. This range, this diversity of goals is, uh, is striking, but it's not enough that we go about populating the world with problems we don't have. We invent a dead body in a locked room and put Sherlock Holmes in there to solve the problem. We worry about the fate of magical creatures or someone sailing to King's Landing with his illegitimate dead daughter. And of course, for thousands of years, we've taken some perfectly innocuous black and white stones and turned them into a made up problem so devilishly hard that it itself has spun the meta problem of whether we could design machines that could outplay us. So what are we doing here? Many approaches in AI and robotics involve intrinsically motivated autonomous agents who set up their own learning goals. The current proposal differs from these accounts and my commitment to the idea that the value of these novel goals is not tied to learning per se, gaining information or reducing uncertainty. And that is because new information and new competencies are very sparse, right? They're hard to learn, but thoughts and proposals and ideas are potentially unlimited. And if problems and goals generate those, and if even a few of those ultimately at the end of the day, even adopted by someone else for an entirely other purpose, prove testable or actionable, that may in the long run lead to learning. 
So one reason our motivational system may be as rich as it is, is because the diversity of goals that we can generate confer an advantage for learning as a species. As humans, we can endogenously fix our utilities on anything at all. And that is important because epistemic goals are not the only or necessarily even the best route to learning. We have first order logic in part because medieval monks wanted incontrovertible proof of the existence of God. We have the microscope in part because a Dutch cloth merchant wanted to be able to examine the quality of his textiles. Being able to want anything at all as a species might let us explore a vast space of possible plans and ideas. And this is especially important because the world is full of unknown unknowns. As great as our uncertainty about the world is, there are more things that we don't even know we don't know. If we only explored in ways that tried to maximize expected information gain, we would miss the chance to gain unexpected information. Creating new problems with no obvious utility in themselves may be the best way to discover genuinely new things. So I'll end by saying, I think play is for all of these things. Again, these accounts are not mutually exclusive, but I think that the particular distinctive features of human cognition must map onto some of the peculiar distinctive features, features uh, of, uh, of uh, distinctively human play. Uh, and this is this they are perhaps most interested uh, in exploring and discussing with all of you. So um, I will end just with a shout out um, to the world of creators who's enabled science to continue in this age of COVID and to encourage all of you to check out both of these, uh, both of these sites. Um, uh, they're field-wide open source, open access resources um, where you can post studies, recruit participants, and we can start pooling participants online to increase the number of, uh, of children available to all of us. So uh, I hope you will all uh, get a chance to check them out. Uh, and I wanna end by thanking my collaborators, my lab um, and our funders, and of course, participating parents and children. Thank you very much. Thank you for this great presentation. And um, yeah, let's let's have some questions. And maybe while people are thinking about questions to ask, maybe I'll take the privilege of asking the first one, which is, um, I, I like this proposal. I find it very interesting. I'm just then wondering, it seems that play is kind of something very distinctly that children do um, and that happens most intensely and most in childhood and I'm wondering then why how that works with your account like why would it be so important for young children to engage in this kind of thinking because I'm wondering wouldn't it make more sense for them to just have very sophisticated learning mechanisms to kind of get up to speed with what is already known by picking that up from um, from other people in their environment and then you know once once they're at that level kind of in a couple of years later, um, when they can actually genuinely in innovate and, and, you know, kind of build further on, on the progress that has already been ma made before them to then engage in these kind of playful um, behaviors and ways of thinking. Thank you for the question, Laura. I think the premise is false. I, what are you all going to do this evening and this weekend? Some of us are gonna spend some of our time doing the things that we have to do, right? The things that have genuine utilities and the one where I spend a lot of time on it. Children spend a lot of time on that too, right? They spend a lot of time um, with tasks, you know, basic learning, basic care skills, um, basic getting around the world skills. We school them, we put them in educational programs very early, but let them off the hook from that for five seconds and let us off the hook from that for five seconds. What do we do? We daydream, we read fiction, we consume movies that, you know, the main benefactor <laughs> Their beneficiaries of this crisis have been Netflix in our country. Um, I'm sure that whatever the web streaming movies are, there's a literally, we put an enormous amount of our per capita income 
in entertainment. It's the thing that is getting us through in some ways. It's totally key to adult sanity right now that we have stories and movies and games. Puzzles went up through the roof as soon as people couldn't go to their daily jobs. I don't think we have any evidence that play is even especially prevalent in childhood. With very young infants and toddlers, we tend to overlook the work they are doing with basic uh, movement and self-care. And so we notice the play, it pops out, it emerges so early, it's distinctive. With other animals, there is no question about it, I think. You really do see more play in juveniles. But with humans, I'm not sure that you do. I'm not sure that you do. All of literature, all of theater, all of movies, all of film, all of sports, right? These things are not necessary, but we seem to find them absolutely essential and are willing to invest huge amounts of our income in. Yeah, that's great. I, I think mean, that, just, is because that is how our minds work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So if I can just have a very quick follow-up. So you think there's no fundamental difference then between child's play and these other things that you mentioned? I have been tempted occasionally to think that, but not very sustainably. I don't think there's a fundamental difference between child. I, that's not true. There are some things that seem to fundamentally differ. Children's peculiar capacity for being able to spontaneously generate pretend play without a lot of advanced coordination is distinctive. Now, of course, there are TV rooms all over this country where a bunch of writers are getting together um, and, and co-creating a, a paracosms. Um, but children can do this kind of spontaneously with everyone with a flexibility that most adults find it hard to keep up with. Um, so there are things that differ, but they're much subtler than any kind of claim like children play or children play more or, or you know, and I, I just don't think we have strong evidence for any of that. That's that's fair. I'm convinced. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so the next question will be by Luca Bonatti, who I think is already unmuted. Yeah. I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, okay. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, it was funny because I was thinking when you were speaking that uh, my form of entertainment is to listen to you talking. I mean, I get pleasure out of it. And so the, the question that I have comes from from this, uh, from this observation, and it is the following. In the kind of behavior that you showed that uh, uh, children have, uh, this uh, um, uh, optimality solution to problem versus playing, what is striking is not only the phenomenon itself, but the fact that they can switch from one to the other with nothing more than saying, why don't you play a little, right? So my question here, and, and yet in, in the kind of, um, and the reconstruction of the playing that you gave this is a very complex activity. It's something like, okay, now you suspend your, as it were, uh, um, uh, search for truth in a certain sense and make up problems for yourself in such a way that you explore your, your, your uh, uh, imaginary uh, problem space and find solution. That's really what play means in your story. And it's very complex, it's way more complex than find what the, how the world look like, looks like, you no? Know? And so my question is, what do you think they actually, what do you think children, so I listen to you because I, I get pleasure out of it. It's really great, right? So kids play because it's really great. So uh, what do you think they understand by what is the semantic of the word play for children? Do you think they really understand it as, okay, it's time for you to just uh, explore problem spaces that don't exist? What is the actual kind of semantics that you think they associate to something such so simple as the word play? It's uh, unsurprisingly an excellent question. And one of the things I've um, wondered about the experiment is, you know, are we tapping into the semantics of their understanding of the word play? Are we tapping into play itself? Um, how would we know? <laughs> um, uh, it is really interesting that just saying the word play invokes this for children. I didn't show you the study we ran just before these, which was just a third party observation of efficient or inefficient action in similar contexts and children were asked which child's playing you know, they have no problem using it for judgment as well, um, as well as enacting it in their own behavior. But of course, using it for judgment is one thing. Enacting it in their own behavior, you're right. It's a hugely complex activity. You tell the child to play, and then what do they do? They look at the room, they look at what it affords, um, and then they generate, you know, goals consistent uh, with the externalities in the environment, but also uh, a suspension of ordinary 
uh, of ordinary utilities. Um, uh, I think I've lost track maybe of the heart of your original question. I think I may be only amplifying it, <laughs> um, but I agree that, go ahead, Luca. No, no, my question was precisely what, what, what we think is what we associate to the word play in an infant's, in a child's mind. And uh, um, uh, in other words, is what you are saying necessary for, so what, what I get- I, did, so I, I, you know, I would say that for distinctively human play, and again, I believe all these forms of play exist. My, my 12 year old, now 13 year old, still spends a lot of time playing with slime. What do I think that is? It's probably the sensory properties of slime are, you know, primate ancestors like squishy bright colored fruit. And so she likes squishy bright colored things. I don't think that has anything to do with prediction or learning or problem solving. And as similarly swinging and spinning and a lot of things. So I think all forms of play exist, but I think it is um, certainly the case that for for some aspects of, again, distinct, what I would suggest is probably distinctively human play. It is interpreted as the opportunity to invent your own utilities. That, that what, what fundamentally defines it is this idea that you can, uh, you can set your own goals and you can set your own costs. Now, I want to be clear, we can also do that in a lot of ways that are not about play. I'm, I'm no more than Wittgenstein going to try for a necessary and sufficient definition of this term. Um, there are lots of ways in which, but, but I think it's actually important and central that many fundamental human activities involve setting a manipulated utility function, right? We, we have a motivational system that expands vastly beyond any other animal. We set our own goals. We are willing to incur not only a necessary cost, but even lethal costs. We're willing to risk our lives for the sake of some goals that are not um, obviously necessary to our survival, right? So that ability to decouple our own utilities from uh, evolutionarily specified ends obviously serves a broader evolutionary specified end, right? It gives us an adaptive niche and like no other creature, um, but it really frees us up in a, in a deep sense from the exigencies of the world. And I think that when you tell children to play, they're, they're tapping into that. And I can't do better than that. I, I maybe, you know, that, that is the next project, right? What are they actually doing? What computations support it? How are they representing this? You know, what, ma what makes it play? Why, you know, what is the reward system tied to it? You know, how does motivation actually interact with cognition? I would have given a much better talk if I could answer any of this. All right, the next question will be by Daniel Swingley. Hi, uh, that was really interesting. I, I've, I, you talked a lot about um, goals and problems, and I wanted to ask what, what those are, what you mean by that? Because it seems to me that a lot of play is partly about instituting a goal, but also about imposing constraints on how you're allowed to achieve it. So you could have play that is, let's put that ball over there, but you're not allowed to use your hands. And it, it seems like a lot of play has that character where you're imposing constraints on the methods you're allowed to use to solve the goal. And in a way, what makes play good is not whether you achieve the goal or not, but how closely you're approximating the constraint that you imposed yourself. Now, is that approximation to the constraints also part of what you mean by uh, what I mean goal? By the or the goal. Yeah, I'm using goal. I, so I, I did not define my terms very carefully here. I'll try to do that more carefully in writing. But um, what I mean here by the goal is not just the end state, right? So the goal yeah. is the entire uh, 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 hacked utility function, right? It is the costs you assume, it is the rewards you achieve, both of which, again, are in some sense arbitrary. Um, so you, you don't need to it this way and you don't even need to achieve this end. And one of the things I didn't get to mention, but I think is really true, it's really important about children's play is that very often, you know, preponderance of the time, maybe for distinctly human play, children don't achieve their goals at all. And they happily abandon them after spending hours working on them, right? Children will set yeah. up a ski resort in their living room that's going to involve the steps and all of this and they play for hours and then you tell them it's lunchtime and you know you have to clean up the mess afterwards, right? They were never going to build a ski resort. <laughs> it wasn't even conceivable. They certainly weren't going to chop a velociraptor or build a, a restaurant or, you know, uh, become astronauts. It doesn't seem to matter. It's that their information in the problem, right? Like a spaceship that has to contain us and be shiny and, you know, have went, gives them enough to generate a plan and a proposal and create a big box and put tinfoil over it, right? And maybe make loud noises. And that, that sets them off thinking and doing. 
the goal is lightweight, right? It's a set of, yeah. of query information, much as the way we answer questions that we don't know the answer to, which we do, you know, not hopefully so much in scientific, but if I ask you any kind of random question, you can use the structure of the question or the query to speculate, right? That speculation is lightweight. You haven't investigated it. You might not be a domain expert. You might be, you know, you know, just, just making up an answer that could be true. That truthiness aspect is part of what is so defining about this, right? It's just that there's enough information there to support proposals. And, and I would suggest that that is the reward signal children are sensitive to. Can I make proposals out of this, right? Is there enough here to let me think? And that is what they're, they're attuned to. Right. Okay. Thanks. So, um, Laura, by the way, do you mind if we stop the screen sharing? Then we can. Oh, I'm sorry. I no, no, it's totally fine. For, for back to the slides, but <laughs> no worries at all. Uh, the next question will be by Rebecca Gelpi. Hi, thanks. Um, so this was a really fantastic talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so one thing that I thought was really interesting that I felt like you kind of touched on for a moment um, was this sort of talking about things like, you know, sports and entertainment as these sorts of forms of play that people take very, very seriously. And it made me think a little bit about, you know, the difference between like play and entertainment and fun. I feel like all words that have a lot kind of in common, um, but also potentially something kind of different in them. And also, I think one thing that I was thinking about is ways in which things like, um, you know, uh, watching, like watching television, uh, or, or creating television or doing sports, have these sort of like massive coordination going on, where essentially, like, there's this sort of collective, everyone is setting their utilities kind of in, in sync um, to to these kind of potentially imaginary benchmarks. And I wonder kind of what you thought about that, like both in, in the context of like, at what point does like, is play no longer, no longer about fun or something like that, where like people are taking it so seriously that the utilities start to take on real meaning. And then like, is it no longer play at that point? Um, and also whether kind of elements of that sort of, um, sort of coordinate, like massive coordination that's going on start to kind of change something from being this sort of like individual kind of, um, you know, imagination and sort of problem posing towards something that has like a lot more sort of like moving in some of the direction of the other kind of other play is for kind of things that you talked about a lot more of the sort of social organizational ones. So two, two, two separate things. First, um, there's no question, as I said, that people can take play both as individuals and as societies very seriously and real utilities, real money, um, real social emotional costs can be tied to it. I think that is true and um, uh, orthogonal to the nature of play and fun itself. So um, uh, again, you, you might have real, you know, real money tied to the outcome of a game, um, but whether you do or you don't doesn't change the arbitrariness of the utility structure of the game itself, right? So, um, and the fact that, you know, your, your child may well burst into tears after a, a game of Candyland doesn't um, actually fundamentally change the idea that, that you've set up uh, arbitrary reward structure and an arbitrary cost structure that is motivating in itself. So when I, when I, you know, fun is a, fun and play again. Um, the semantics of these words one could keep, I think, a, a, a semanticist busy for for many careers. But I think the notion that we are motivated by problems that have enough information to let us generate these these solutions, and that is what we mean by fun. It is pleasurable to engage in these activities. Um, uh, that is remains true, even when it is coupled to other real. So that 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 process can be coupled to anything, and it can be coupled to genuine utilities that are very serious and have you know um, you know even dire outcomes. Right? People do risk their lives playing um, in, in in some cases. So um, I think that you know both of these are phenomena are true. Play involves arbitrary utilities, and we sometimes take them and map them onto genuine utilities, um, but they're separate. 
the other issue you raised about massive coordination in uh, in this made up utility function. I think that is totally fascinating. I don't have a lot to say about it, but I think it is super interesting that we can all buy into it, right? And that we do all buy into it. You set up a structure. So, you know, one of the things that's striking about fiction is it does not have to be true, but it does have to set up a compelling problem and solve for it. You know, some forms of very weird postmodern experimental, fi you know, uh, uh, fiction doesn't, uh, but then it sort of sets up a meta problem of whether you can do that. <laughs> And get away with it. Um, but most uh, most stories, the, the only criteria is that it sets up a, an interesting problem and then involves a plan or solves for it. And we find that like catnip, right, <laughs> um, for humans. Uh, and, and I think that's, that is super interesting. And we do use it to coordinate large scale efforts. And I think it is interesting and important that those aspects of play that we find super rewarding also connect to a lot of uh, 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 both of those aspects right the fact that we can we find this super rewarding we can use it to coordinate across groups and it can be tied to real world utilities right all of these matter all of these are why it doesn't just stay in this domain of um you know this this kind of interesting niche phenomenon but might really be important for uh our species success as a whole. Um, the next, by the way, we want to explicitly also encourage a question from junior people and students. So if you have one, just write in the chat. Uh, the next question will be by Juri. I think you're already unmuted. Yeah, thank you. Uh, wonderful talk, very. Um, I have a very simple question. Is uh, in how, how central, or if it, is it central to this view of play, is that it the social dimension that it's social. So it's very good to play. But often, it's what's really good about it that you play together with someone. I understand that you play solitary as well, and that that that's entertaining, and you are not bored, and you can do that, and. Uh, it may um, serve the kind of, uh, you know, uh, epistemic purpose that you see in it, but uh, um, it's probably contaminated with, with uh, the fact that many, many, we are social and many of the, you know, that the goals and, and epistemic uh, inventions that we come up with is, is in, in fact have social functions. Uh, but uh, you could have described this whole talk without mentioning uh, that you do it with others. That was my impression. I mean, the argument, the argument itself does not uh, require that at all. And I just wonder whether, what's your view, view on that? It's of course not a simple question. It's a very interesting question. It's true that I described the whole talk um, uh, in a way that that does not depend on social aspects of play at all. Um, um, and that said, I think there's an interesting argument that distinctively human play would not get off the ground or characterize human behavior the way it does if it weren't for precisely the kind of massive coordination possibilities that Rebecca pointed to and that you're talking about, right? That we do, of course, um, I, that when my daughter said, I'm playing, um, what she meant was, mommy, go away with your iPhone camera and leave me alone, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, the, 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 the desire to play in private um, is real. And, and we do, of course, read books, engage in fiction, um, play, uh, play alone. Um, and the children in those rooms, usually if we want them to play, we walk away, right? So the design of most of our experiments involve taking the parent aside and talking to them about debriefing the study so that the child can play un uninterrupted. Nonetheless, um, I think that if you only played by yourself and if you did not share these 
um, manipulative utility functions um, and the ideas and proposals that were invented if they, if they did not become part of the larger social infrastructure, it's hard to see how it could actually make an impact on our incredibly social and coordinated lives. And again, if you think about that, that slide I put up with the vast diversity of goals, right? Um, most creatures, even social creatures, don't specialize, right? Don't have these, these, you know, I mean, we're here talking about cognitive development. There are other conferences going on talking about entirely other things that we might have no interest in and wouldn't even find fun or pleasurable, right? Um, so, so this, the ability, the luxury of having these really idiosyncratic goals depends, I think, upon being part of a species where others conspecifics have different ones, right? We couldn't survive, none of us would eat, right? Or have houses, let alone half of the luxuries we do um, uh, if, if we only engaged in the kinds of things that, that we did here. So I think that it is critical to play that we, uh, and to our ability to manipulate our utility functions that we know we can depend on others, members of our species to do this in other ways and, and then share those resources together. All right, uh, the next question, maybe let's let Pierre Jacob ask because he has not asked a question yet. I think you should be unmuted. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. It was wonderful talk and very, very rich. One thing at some point you, you, you drew a contrast between learning and thinking and you made critical remarks about the idea that uh, playing would serve mostly learning. And you argued that play, playing might actually serve thinking as opposed to learning. So my very simple question, to what extent is learning not part of thinking and to what extent isn't thinking you know, something that is intrinsically connected to learning? So, so what, I mean, so what's your grounds for really drawing the, something like a sharp distinction between learning and thinking? Well, some of it's rhetorical, right? I've spent my okay. life thinking about play as learning, um, of course, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, a strong advocate of, of that work. Um, so part of it is a rhetorical um, uh, you know, maneuver to emphasize the ways that, that I think that work still fails to characterize a lot of what is most interesting um, about play. What is the distinction? Um, you know, it, 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 you can think about it in a lot of ways, um, but when we think about learning, we think about learning new knowledge or new skills, right? Which requires that you get new evidence, new information out there, or uh, develop new competencies. And, and if you're trying to engineer that, the, the precise reward signal that you are getting is from uh, you know, reduction in error or increased precision uh, in your movements. And, and you know, one real concern, um, even in engineering these, is that those are sparse. Right. Um, once you've explored an environment, you might have, you know, pretty much gotten all the information out there. Um, when children go to play, you know, when when a, when a four year old goes to play with um, uh, uh, play doh, right, and a box. What are they really going to learn about Plato that they didn't learn in four previous years of playing with Plato and boxes, right? They've learned a lot. They have the motor skills. They couldn't play the way they did if they didn't have all of those skills, if they didn't know all the properties and containment relations and support and the you know, stickiness and all of that of the Plato. There, there just may not be a lot left to learn per se. And there may not be a lot of competencies left to build with this material, right? So what could possibly be the reward signal that is going on there when it's not obvious that they're making better predictive models about Plato or boxes of their abilities or even what they can do with it in any sense that is allowed just by the activity itself. It has to be the internal representation. And if that Plato's a velociraptor, right, and that thing is a box, and they've just spun off a whole set of plans about possible worlds, well, then, you know, the reward signal could just be that they are thinking things, right, that they are generating ideas. And again, those ideas may not be achievable, they may not be testable, they may not be good ideas, they may not be practical, but they're abundant, right? And they're only an abundant, and again, they're not easy to access, right? If I just say, think of something, you'll sit and stare at me, 
right? If I say, think of a way to catch a velociraptor with Play-Doh, you know, you'll go, <laughs> right? So, so um, it doesn't take a lot, but it does take structure, right? It takes something. And, and it's that ability, that's, that is, you know, I think what I'm talking about when I talk about somehow the intrinsic reward for this form of distinctively human play has got to be a representation of how many proposals, hypotheses, thoughts, plans, ideas you can generate, not how much uncertainty you're reducing or how much better you're getting at the world because often you're not. And we know this as scientists, right? We spend lots and lots and lots of time thinking and the amount of time we get new evidence or get better at things like that does happen. <laughs> but but, but we're, we're highly motivated all the rest of the time too. Right, we're we're very interested. You know, what are we all doing here? You know, our governments are collapsing in many places. We have a you know international pandemic going on, and the pleasure and reward of just thinking about ideas that we don't know if we're right, we don't know if they're testable, we don't know if they'll go anywhere, we don't know if they're actionable. Deeply motivating. It is fun, right? It's you know the most fun I've had in <laughs> um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of this year. So there's something about the value of ideas per se uh, that humans, I think, are, are very sensitive to. We have a question in the chat from Eva Wanda that I'll just read out. Um, she asks, "Isn't the social co coordination of arbitrary utilities fundamental to human sociality as a whole? If we couldn't make things up together and set arbitrary or even imaginary goals, we couldn't have initiation rituals, ceremonial societies, or any other distinctively human activities." No. Exactly. I mean, again, I I, I think that um, play is so ubiquitous in humans, right? It emerges cross-culturally, it emerges uh, early in infancy, um, and it persists, I would say, in very rich form throughout adulthood, that, that it doesn't seem reasonable to think about it in any way separate from thinking about how the human mind works in general, right? And and, and the distinct of our distinctive ability to do these coordinations around arbitrary utility functions um, uh, at, you know, these things are adult behaviors, right? Obviously babies and toddlers and preschoolers don't make up religions or rituals. They, they learn about them, they, they come to participate in them. Um, but if they didn't find it rewarding very early to engage in these kinds of cognitive activities, it's not obvious that they could develop into organisms who could create these kinds of structures. Next question by Valent Varga. Uh, thank you for the talk. So you emphasized the arbitrariness of these made up uh, problems. And I'm just wondering, so from a scientific perspective, uh, I guess these problems are nevertheless determined by some factors what is going to be the actual problem that is sought. And do you have some thoughts on that, what these factors could be? That's an excellent question, right? So where do these goals come from, right? How do we, how do we hit on our myriad idiosyncratic preferences, right? The desire to do this thing here, there, you know, how, how do we generate the goals themselves? Um, I think, the, I, I don't have good answers to it. I think the arbitrariness and the generativity is, um, it, it, to my mind, it's importantly linked with the arbitrariness and generativity of language itself, right? We can combine, we can compose. Pierre Oudier has actually talked uh, in, a, in, a, in a recent paper um, about the compositionality. Um, and I point to those queries and how just asking a question, right, informs the answer. So our ability to compose ideas generally, to put them together, um, uh, the, the, the force you get from having a grammar that lets you combine these in, in things that are are in one hand arbitrary and in the other hand deeply structured um, and, and invest them with meaning, I think has something to do with that, but I cannot tell you where goals come from. But someday, maybe you will. <laughs> uh, next, Luca Bonatti has another question. Yes, uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, 
Let me go back on this issue about sociality and ask you, so we are not going to find a single one dimensional answer to the question, why do we pay? And uh, although I think that you have a really, really good um, chance at getting the, the fundamental part of it. But the sociality part is important. And uh, um, the, there are two possibilities. One is that uh, this is really an orthogonal issue, right? You, we, are, we play socially because we do everything socially and there will be another separate explanation of what. Or else there could be something which has to do with the intrinsic nature. The reason why I'm asking the question is always about what computation is being done by kids when they know they put themselves into play mode. So the second possibility is uh, there is something intrinsic into the activity that you think is important in playing, which in your uh, hypothesis essentially is generating arbitrary structures and uh, exploring them, that sort of thinking. Yeah. So my question is you who are in this place where everybody is an engineer, um, uh, do you think can be actually, do you think we can get an answer by modeling? In other words, suppose that that this playing is uh, uh, somewhat generating. So take the, the example of the work on, on blocks uh, by Josh, you and other people. You put the blocks and these are physical constraints will make you fall and you actually have a good ability to predict what kind of configuration can stay up and not or, or can fall down. While in playing, you don't have this configuration, you make them up. And the point about games is that there is a stability that they have to reach so that some games are successful since some games. So you are free, you can do whatever you want. And that's really what, what is about. But the space is way too big. And then maybe you can actually make some sort of, as it were, argument for convergence. Namely, uh, that when you are really, uh, as it were, creating a structure, perhaps the fact that it's collective creating relatively created is what allows the structure to stay up a little better as opposed to falling down so that the sociality is really intrinsic to the uh, the actual computation that is being done i wonder whether you have thought in this direction namely really modeling under what conditions the sociality of game gives stability to what is being done in such a way that next time it's staying, you don't need to invent another one or whatever, it's staying there and just as it were sedimenting into a game with rules and so on and so on. In this sense, it would be intrinsic to the computation. So for example, the very basic fact, so in your experiments, maybe you have versions which are social, but you don't even know if uh, the kids would prefer to play together or to play alone if you let them play. My, my guess is that uh, uh, they would, if you, if you just have two kids and say, okay, now play for a moment and then bring me the pen or whatever, they'd probably play together. I mean, the, the default is this is a social activity, but not because you are a social animal, rather because that's the way in which you increase the chances to converge towards something that stands up in terms of an algebraic structure of the problem space that you are making up entirely, you know, inventing it. So I wonder whether you thought in this sense, like modeling, what are the convergence uh, you know, points, the, the, the point that they stay up the, the, in playing and whether the sociality is really a byproduct of this, the fact that you increase the probability to have something which is stable. So let me pull this apart a little bit. Um, there's a question of sociality, there's a question of, of computation. Um, so again, about sociality uh, and, and the social nature of play, I think it is true, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to either understate it or overstate it. Which is to say, of course, we engage in rich social play, and we are richly social animals. I really do believe that, you know, the the kinds of um, ways that play has taken off, the successes of play, the degree to which it characterizes human behavior couldn't exist if we were not uh, the kind of creature who also uh, shared information. I think there's super rich, interesting questions about how we engage in that coordination um, and, and what it means. So I, I believe all of that. I also believe that in particular cases, the whole reason why we tested dyads instead of singletons in that very early experiment in graduate school is that if you want to do interventions to isolate variables in experiment, the more children are pulling gears off of a toy, the more probability are that you pull off each gear separately um, and I get to observe the 
the relevant data. So in, in, in particular cases, more strictly better as long as you're not knocking each other to the ground and distracting each other, which I will note also happens <laughs> with dyads and play in a way it does not happen with singletons. So I think I think there are advantages to social play um, uh, in, in many contexts, but I also think individual play is both hugely characteristic of humans happens all the time and is also important to learning and of course babies toddlers very young children only engage in that kind of play they, uh, i mean they engage in some social play with their parents but with their peers um, they engage in parallel play which is to say they're each doing their own thing they're not really coordinating that well um, uh, for, for a couple of years but i think both of these are, are super important i think they're separate from the question of, about computation and models. First, all credit to Jess Hamrick and Pete Battaglia and Josh Tenenbaum on, on the blocks and stability models. I, I'm only an admirer of that work. Um, but uh, do I think that we need computation to constrain these hypotheses and tell us what's actually going on in play? Absolutely, right? And, and I think that what I'm most interested in is understanding the information, how, how both the information structure that we represent in goals and problems and our sensitivity to it, right? So how do we, how do we know when a problem imposes enough constraints to be a good idea? Not every idea is fun. Not every game is good, right? Not everything is motivating. And I think that it is a, lots of things affect motivation, including, of course, social pressures and reputation and friendship and, you know, uh, your state variables, how relaxed you are, etc. But there is something about motivation that I would say is deeply connected to the actual computational structure of the representation of the goal that you have, right? This problem either contains enough information to support thought or it doesn't. And we sort of know that, right? We sort of, you know, we'll sit, those of us who are faculty or mentoring younger students in any form will say, you know, okay, okay, you're talking about an idea, but it doesn't really take off because it doesn't have enough information to let you think about the next idea. It's not that you've solved the idea when the student has a great idea, you've gotten no new data at that point, right? You just know that there's something in this, in this space that has enough information to allow you to continue, to allow you to think, to allow you to advance it, right? I think we're sensitive to that. I don't know what computations support that kind of representation. I think there's really interesting work, Josh uh, Tenenbaum, uh, uh, um, Roger Levy, their student um, Peng, um, uh, have been doing quite amazing work with with language and noting when you can fill in the blanks and when you can't, right? And when it's interesting too. So if I give you a sentence, you know, like um, he put the blank over there, you, you can fill it in easily with a number of things. If I just say he, you know, what are you gonna do, <laughs> right? There's almost too many solutions. Many, many theories of curiosity and expression talk about these sweet spots, right? The Goldilocks effect, moderate complexity, right? What do we mean by all of that? I would suggest that we mean something like, there is enough information in the structure that we can generate new ideas. If there's too much information, you can't generate very many ideas. There's only one maybe unique solution. Um, if there's too much entropy over the possible hypotheses, you also can't generate ideas. So we are sensitive to these features. I think understanding that formally is, would be hugely important and would um, tell us a lot about what we find motivating. So, so if I may, just if I understand where you're asking, it's we're technically over time, so I don't know, Laura. Are you fine with extending another I will ten minutes or so? I find this very rewarding, but I think there's probably a lot of other activities on the schedule. But of course, I will I will stay here all day. I mean, we're we're fine, so we could we could go for another couple of minutes. But there's also several more questions in the chat. So, Luca, is it okay if you? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So okay. the next question would be by Amanda Seed, and maybe let's Amanda. keep them short. <laughs> Hello, hey. can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Um, I know over time I wanted to very briefly share an observation I have of a chimpanzee, a little juvenile chimpanzee um, self-handicapping when she was trying to cross a rope, like a tight rope with her hands over her eyes. And she went back and did this like five or six times. I couldn't help thinking about that as you were talking about these kids uh, setting themselves difficult problems. Um, but I did have a question. Um, so I was thinking about your earlier work where children were, um, you know, really usefully disambiguating information in play. 
And then this more recent study where you've shown that the nature of your instructions can have such a big impact on what kids do. And I wondered if um, these children were, so I think usually the children are told, oh, this is how, let, let's see if we can figure out how this works or, or some sort of kind of instruction that there's a goal that we want you to work towards. Um, if they were just told like, would you, how, how about you play with this box? Would they, do you think they would have been as likely to disambiguate that information or would the, the frequency of that discovery have been lower? So um, uh, again, two interesting things in the question. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, I'll answer the last one first. I think actually that the way we've typically given instructions in our lab, I'd have to go back and uh, <laughs> look at individual papers, but I think it's actually quite like the way we gave it here where we combine it. We say, can you go ahead and play and figure this out? Right, so, so because I've always been interested in play, I think we have almost always referred to play. It's, you know, almost never been just, you know, find out how this thing works. Um, um, also, it's a natural way to speak to children. Um, and we've usually walked away. Also, we've done environmental things as we did in, in um, these studies to make it look playful. And I, I know much less about this, but I know intuitively when, you know, I design studies, that box is colorful, the things are novel, they're shiny things. You know, I don't know what those features are. I suspect that those are also rare and sparse and that they are cues that this is a time for a um, manipulated utility function, right? I think that we probably signal in various ways um, with, with information environment when we can to children um, that this is that this is playful. Um, but I, I think in our studies, we do a bit of both. We probably confound those. I think it's an interesting question, what happens as you vary the task instructions? Certainly we found other studies where there's effects of um, uh, what children think you are asking and how they, how they subsequently explore. So I think it's a really interesting question. Um, on your wonderful chimpanzee, um, there is no doubt that other animals engage in, in this kind of soft handicapping behavior. And, and again, I think it makes sense because our behavior came from somewhere, right? So we have, we have you know, long evolutionary histories shared with uh, a lot of clever animals. Um, and, and the prevalence of, um, uh, so, you know, puppies, when they go to, to play fight, they, they do something that is silly. They crouch down and, you know, of course they should tower up, <laughs> but they, but they crouch down, they make it harder. Animals like find unstable branches and swing on them. I can't believe your chimpanzee actually blindfolded itself, but that's marvelous. I mean, I can't of course believe it, but it's a marvelous, um, it's a marvelous observation. And, uh, I think it was Spinka, um, you know, said, you know, this is preparation for the unexpected by deliberately putting themselves in precarious situations or difficult um, places from which to crouch or fight or balance, um, the animals will be more prepared when they get into contexts where, where unexpected things might happen because they'll have some experience with those. And again, I believe this. I, I, I don't think these accounts of play are mutually exclusive. I think that those behaviors um, uh, and that tendency to, to, to do behaviors that put animals in challenging situations and the reasons those were adaptive are probably the foundation of our ability then to say you know just set the wheels off right <laughs> like great you know now do it you know blindfolded backwards you know <laughs> right um to, to achieve a, a goal that may never translate in any immediate direct way to a context where you're hunting or fighting or balancing right so both the costs and the rewards in human play um uh just blossom out, but I think it, it is, is deeply related to these kinds of behaviors in animal play uh, as well. And then we have one more quick question, hopefully by Malin Forgat, who should be unmuted, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for these wonderful uh, ideas. So it particularly struck me your uh, suggestion that practically all or every play is pretend pretense play in some sense. And also the idea that there's this continuity into adulthood uh, with entertainment. Uh, and uh, so I was thinking about still as if there seems to be a, 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 a difference uh, or isn't there a difference uh, really in, in your opinion uh, in terms of, for example, the the, the level of that uh, uh, adults play so much more seriously. So kids seem to be so much more flexible uh, in 
pretense and and or or changing the the game itself, or the range of the games they play, or the uh, 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 level of activity they uh, 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 engage in play, they do it much often. So this is uh, nothing particular of children's play. Uh, 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 they are just uh, improving their thinking a lot more, or uh, 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 is this something that uh, uh, is constrained by other factors? Um. I, I, I do believe that, so I, I mean, many things, again, one, one says partly for rhetorical aim and, um, you know, I, in some sense, I can say that all play is pretend play, but of course, I still think that there are really interesting distinctive things about the things that we call pretend play versus the things that we call exploratory play. You know, I just mean here that the, the goals and rewards in some sense are imaginary that we impose them. Um, and, uh, um, uh, similarly, although I really do think there's that that we should focus at least as much on the continuity of play across the lifespan in humans, um, I do think that children do play in distinctive ways, but I think it's it is non-trivial to pin those down, right? So. Um, uh, especially to pin them down in a context that is not bespoke to a specific experimental paradigm, where very often differences in prior knowledge or differences in, you know, working memory or, you know, things broadly executive function um, about the task or understanding of the task demands. It's very hard to escape those particulars and say something quite general about the respects in which children's play differs from adult play. But I think it is telling that adults often find it exhausting to play with children, right? So that that to me is a real and pervasive phenomenon, right? So we, we do play as adults, we engage in all kinds of things. We find it totally exhausting to spend hours playing uh, with children. Even I, who love it and have like lots of metacognition about it, <laughs> <laughs> would be like, how many times can you put the octopus <laughs> when, when I'm invited at all um, to participate? And I'm obviously worse at it, right? I'm obviously worse at it. Like, so, I mean, my daughter's now 13, those things are no longer true. But when she was little, um, you know, she and her friends could go on and on and on. And for me, it was effortful and difficult. And I didn't, couldn't keep up. I didn't experience what they were experiencing and engaging in the same behavior they were behaving behaving. That is real. And I don't understand it, right? I don't know what that's about. But I think it's definitely real. Um, I, I just don't think I, I, I know exactly why. Um, but I will say adults don't always play seriously. I mean, I don't know what's uh, going on uh, uh, in Europe or elsewhere, but in the US, there's this game Among Us that has swept the universe. It's a little app game with imposters. Our you know, uh, representatives are campaigning using the text box in this game. It's so widely played. It's mostly adults um, and older children. It's not the really little ones um, who are engaging it. Nobody plays this game seriously, <laughs> right? But everybody plays it passionately. <laughs> so. Uh, so I think, again, there is a lot of continuity, but you're, you're certainly not wrong that there's something going on in children's play that's a little ineffable still. Um, and, and particularly, I think, salient when you try to play with a child. Yeah, lots of open questions still. I think that became clear. Um, let us thank Laura Schultz again 